Well, here's quite an introduction for our next guest. He, of course, predicted the financial crisis. New York University professor Nuriel, Nuriel Rabini joins us. He is live from the Ambrosetti workshop in Cenobio in Italy. Uh, the forum's theme this year is intelligence on the world, Europe and Italy, Nuriel. So shall we start with the world, and more specifically the United States? Just how strong do you see the economy in the U.S. progressing right now? Uh, there is an economic recovery, but in my view, it's very fragile. Uh, GDP growth in the third quarter might be barely uh, two percent. In the second quarter, excluding inventories, was less than two percent. There is an improvement in the labor market, but in part is due to a fall in the labor force participation rate. And if you look at the components of aggregate demand, uh, government spending is still falling. There is a fiscal drag. You have that uh, capital spending has been weak based on the latest durable goods number. Some of the recent indicators of housing suggest a softening of housing. Consumption in July was flat, and net exports have been actually worsening. So people talk about this very strong acceleration in U.S. economic growth, but if you look at the data, I think that the picture is mixed, and we're still growing barely 2 percent or below, with this subpar below trend, below potential. So with that as your base expectation or your base assessment of the U.S. economy, Nuriel, do you then think it would be foolish for the Federal Reserve to start tapering in September? Well, the data are mixed and the improvement in the outlook is not really very, very, very strong. Uh, the Fed may start tapering in September, but... Uh, 10-year Treasury yields are already close to 3 percent, and that tightening of uh, financial condition could even worsen further the interest rate sensitive sectors like housing and capital spending. So in my view, either the Fed is not going to decide to taper in September, or if they do uh, decide to taper in September, the statement is going to have to be very dovish. Things along the lines where start reducing the number of purchases of MBS and our treasuries, but whether we're going to continue or whether we're going to stop or whether we're going to reverse it is going to depend significantly on the evolution of economic data. Because if they come out with a hawkish statement as opposed to a dovish one, then 10 year yields could go well above 3%, and that's going to choke the economic recovery. So I, I think that the, some of the increase in rates is unwarranted, but they have to come up with a very dovish statement, even if they were to start in September, let alone if they don't, in order to prevent further rising yields. We heard yesterday from the ECB, Nuriel, of course, with their no change in interest rates, uh, Mario Draghi talking about the very, very green shoots of recovery. How, how strong do you see things or how weak do you see things in the Eurozone then? There has been an improvement in the Eurozone, but uh, five of the seven countries in the periphery are still in a recession, even if and when Italy, Spain and others are going to have positive economic growth is going to be barely above uh, zero percent, and therefore the fundamental problem of the Eurozone have not been resolved. Low potential growth because of slow reform, uh, near recession or very anemic recovery, a debt dynamic for public debt that is well above 100 percent of GDP for Italy, for Spain and other periphery countries, and it's going to keep on rising. And the problems of competitiveness have not been resolved. Some of the improvement in the current account has been cyclical, a collapse of imports due to recession rather than being structural. So while the tail risk of a Greek exit, the tail risk of a, a Spain or Italy losing market access have been significantly reduced, thanks to whatever it takes, thanks to the OMT, thanks to the ESM, the fundamental problems of the Eurozone periphery have not been resolved. Nuriel, you talk to us with this beautiful, tranquil Italian backdrop behind you, but of course Italian politics is anything but tranquil right now. Enrico Letta, the Prime Minister of Italy, saying at the G20 he's confident of his government's survival. How big a risk factor is Italy right now, do you think? It's a very large risk factor because, of course, Berlusconi right now is threatening uh, to essentially pull the plug on this government uh, if they don't give him a pardon or a way out of uh, prison and so on. Uh, we'll see whether that's a bluff or whether it's not. If it's not a bluff, this government could collapse before a budget law is passed. There could be elections uh, before the end of the year. 
even if this government were to survive, uh, it's likely it's going to collapse by year end and you'll have election in the spring. So the chance that this government is going to last for a year or two, something that Italy needs to do, structural reform, in my view, are still relatively low. And there is political uncertainty not just in Italy, there is also in the rest of the periphery of the Eurozone. Uh, in Greece, the government could eventually fall in the next six months. There is tensions in Portugal, in Spain. And now we have also the uncertainty of the German election, whether it's going to be the same coalition or a grand coalition. And broadly, in the Eurozone, you have austerity fatigue in the periphery, and you have bailout fatigue in the core. So there is also that tension that is looming. Yeah, plenty of known unknowns to, uh, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, of course. Um, looking at the question of Syria, this, of course, is a big topic of discussion at the G20 at the moment, and a number of leaders at the G20 making the point that any um, Western intervention in Syria would actually weigh on the global economy. Are you surprised by that connection, or is it a sensible one to make? Well, the uh, noise about maybe a Syria attack has already led to some increase in oil prices. If the attack were to be surgical one or two days and then stopping, uh, then probably the effect on oil prices is going to be somehow moderated. But if this uh, conflict were to aggravate and somehow to escalate, depending on the response of Syria, it could become something more regional, then the increase in oil prices could be longer, more significant, more persistent. And certainly the last thing that the fragile global economy uh, needs right now is a very sharp hike in uh, oil prices will be damaging to all importing countries from the US, Europe, Japan, China, India and many other emerging markets that are net oil and energy importers. At the G20, of course, there's a lot of conversation about emerging markets and the effect that any tapering by the Federal Reserve of their bond buying program might have on emerging markets. Do you think that's what's driving any weakness in the emerging market story right now or is it down to fundamentals of growth? What's your take? It's a combination. You have had this double whammy of the fate tapering signals and the rise in U.S. Uh, long rates. You have had also the slowdown of China that has led to a fall, if not the end of the super commodity cycle. And now you have also fundamental problems. There are countries among emerging markets that have macro financial weaknesses, India, Indonesia, Turkey, South Africa, Brazil. They have current account deficits, they have fiscal deficits, they have falling economic growth, they have had inflation above targets, and all of them to different degrees they have social and political protests, demonstration, instability, and elections coming in the next 12 to 18 months. And their policy choices are ugly. If they try to avoid the overshooting downward of the exchange rates, that will be inflationary. They have to kill economic growth. That will lead to more social political instability. If instead they ease monetary policy and go for growth, the currency could go in the free fall. They would jeopardize the financing of their current account deficit. So in some sense, them if you do, them if you don't. There are some improvements. Most of these countries, compared to emerging market crises of the previous decade, they have more flexible exchange rates, they have a war chest of reserves, and have less currency mismatches, less liability dollarization. So probably we're not going to end up into another massive EM crisis as we had 10, 15 years ago, but some of these countries, if they make policy mistakes, could end up into a much uglier situation. Nouriel, you sound fairly gloomy. Uh, the, the, the Dr. Doom uh, moniker still seems to hold true. Do you feel fairly gloomy? Well, no. I think that uh, compared to a year ago, things probably are better in the global economy. There has been some improvement in advanced economies, especially uh, in the United States. The tail risk of a Eurozone breakup uh, has been uh, reduced. The risk of a pure Chinese hard landing has been reduced. But there are, of course, some old risks and there are also some new risks, and some of the new risks also have a geopolitical component. So I would say it's exactly a known unknown situation in which there are many uh, uncertainties in the global economy. Some of them may end up better, some of them may end up worse. Uh, still a relatively fragile recovery, but there has been a global economic recovery. That's good to hear. Nuriel, thank you very much for joining us. New York University professor Nuriel Rabini joining us live from Chernobyl at the Ambrosetti Forum.